Can we start? Thank you very much indeed. Sorry about that. Uh, slow start. Uh, before we proceed, may I ask our religious leaders to offer uh, prayers for us. Imam Jalo, you have the floor, please. Auzubillahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Rahmanir Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. هدنا السرات المستقيم سرات الذين علمت عليهم خير المحذوب عليهم ولا الدالين فلله الحمد رب السماوات ورب الأرض رب العالمين وله الكبر يعوف في السماوات والأرض وهو عزيز الحكيم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون Assalamun ala al-Musaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Amin. Amin. Thank you very much, Imam Jalo, for that. Bishop, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Lord God of grace, as we continue our TRRC sitting today, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with each and every one of us in the TRRC the legal team, the media, and those who are listening at home and at abroad. We pray that the truth will continue to surface and that as the truth come out, there will be healing, there will be reparation, and your justice will also take place. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, my Bishop, for those prayers. Council, are we ready with um, uh, this afternoon's witness? Please proceed, if we are. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. We are ready to proceed. The witness is on the screen. Good afternoon, Mrs. Bajan C. Sejaite. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for um, testifying before the TRRC. I understand that it is quite early in the U.S. How are you today? Alhamdulillah. I'm doing fine, thank you. Before we, we begin, I'd like to um, give you the affirmation so that you can um, attest to um, the content of what you will tell the commissioners today. So if you just repeat after me. I, Bajan Sise Jaite. I, Bajan Sise Jaite. Affirm that I will speak the truth. Affirm that I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Can you please state your full name for the record? My name is Bajan Sise Jaite. Thank you very much for that. As you know, we've spoken a few times, so you know that my name is Horeja Balage, and I will be questioning you today on behalf of the commissioners. Yes. Um, before we go into the topics that we will address today, can I just begin by asking you to introduce yourself very briefly so that the commissioners will know who you are? Again, my name is Bajin Sise Jaite. I am one of Usman, Sise, Usman Koro Sise's younger sisters. How many siblings did Usman Korosise have? Or how many siblings are you in total? Uh, we have six siblings total. 
Who's the oldest member of your family? We have a sister, Ami, and then followed by Usman, then followed by myself, Aisatu, Sukai, Nafi, and Binta. We have heard a lot of testimony surrounding the death of your brother, Usman Korosise. But before we go into the events surrounding his death, I would like to begin by just asking you if you could give us an idea of who he was, a profile of Usman Korosise, the man. Maybe a bit about his biographical background as well as his personality. Uh, Osman was born March 10th, 1962 to Saini Sise and Fatumata Sanya. And um, we, I believe they lived in Brikama, uh, Pakalinde, Brikama, and then moved to Dipakunda, where Usman went to Serakunda Primary School. After he passed his common entrance, he went to Gambia High School up to the sixth form. Then from Gambia High School, Usman went to Legon University in Ghana. After completing his bachelor's degree, Usman came home briefly before he proceeded to Australia to do his master's degree. Usman was a fine gentleman a combination of both mom and dad, a very loving, very disciplined, humble, hardworking. Usman believed in youth information and he also believed in the power that youths have to transform any place if given the opportunity. So he was our role model he was very smart, very welcoming, and he's always smiling. We have heard a little about his signature smile. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what he studied? You said he went to the University of Legon. Do you remember what he studied and when he graduated? I believe he studied um, agroeconomics in Ghana, and um, if I can recall, he graduated, um, let me see, um, that's not, I'm not very sure about that. I, that's perfectly getting, fine, please continue. I'm kind of yeah. blocking it right now. But he proceeded to Australia where he had his master's in economics. So after Usman, um, or Korosise as some people call him, when he came back to Gambia, can you tell us what he did? Where did he work? When he came back, he worked briefly for the NIB, I believe it used to be called. Um, for the National Investment probably, Board, is that it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And briefly for couple months or I think up to a year and then in his vision of believing in the youth and the transformation of the country he joined hands with some talented youths to start up an IT firm called the Quantum Associates. Do you recall for how long he worked at Quantum Associates? Um, I cannot recall for how long, but I know he started. He set up that um, that farm with some guys, and it was during that time, not long after he started, that he was approached by the AFPRC. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, what was he approached to do for the AFPRC? He was approached, um, I believe, because of his talent and his belief in transformation of the country. He was approached to help 
set up the government and work with the AFPRC. Do you recall around when he was approached? That would be March of 1995. Can you tell us which position he was um, approached um, in relation to? What was the AFPRC offering him? I believe, if I can recall right, it was something to do with advising the president at the time. And um, at that capacity, he served briefly before being promoted to be the Minister of Finance and Trade. Can you tell us a bit about what led to his decision to accept a position with the AFPRC government? His decision was because he believed those young guys, when they took over the government, with the promise that they were going to walk and transform the Gambia for the Gambian people, which was also in line with Usman's beliefs. So he said that would be an opportunity for him to further serve the Gambia and help the Gambian people. How did you and the rest of your family react to his acceptance of a position within the AFPRC government? Um, the very first time I received a phone call from the State House of March 1995, in the afternoon around 1.30 p.m., I was not very happy. I related the message to my mom. She wasn't very happy either. Why weren't you happy? I was just a little bit skeptical about the military poise. For me, for me, it was all about power, force, obey, and don't, don't complain. And that is not Koro's personality. So after assessing that situation, I just knew Koro would have a clash with those boys. Did you have a chance to relay your concerns to Koro? Yes, ma'am, I did. I remembered I left that evening to go to work. I was a nurse at the children's hospital. So when I left around 7, 7.30 in the evening, I told my mom to tell Koro if he had the chance to come over at the hospital, I needed to talk to him about the information that I received that afternoon. And did you eventually speak to him about your reservations? Yes, I did. Um, around 9.30 that night, Koro came over to the children's hospital. And um, I, I remember we walked out outside the building and I told him that mom and I are very happy about the position that you were offered this afternoon because these military boys use force, they like to obey and tell you orders without people complaining. And knowing you, that is not what you stand for. You are going to have problems with the boys. He looked at me and said, don't worry, it's for the country. This is above me, I have to work for the country. I further told him that he has to be very careful he looked at me and said, don't worry, little sister, I will. So you had a very close relationship with your brother, is that correct? Yes, yes. He accepted a position around March 1995 and soon after became the Minister of Finance. Yes. During that time, did he at any point relay any concerns that he had about working with the AFPRC government? Um, generally speaking, Koro is very tight-lipped and very disciplined. He hardly says anything about his work. However, um, May, of two, two, May of 1995, I walked in my mom's bedroom 
and found Koro and my mom having a discussion. Upon entering the room, I could see my mom was a little bit uncomfortable looking on facial expressions. I asked what was going on. Koro just said, oh, nothing to worry about. But mom told me, Koro just related a message to her saying uh, he had an argument with Lieutenant Edward Singate at the time and Edward Singate threatened to kill Koro. Who, would, who was Lieutenant Edward Singate at that time? He was the vice chairman. And according to what Koro told your mom, Edward Singate threatened to kill him following an argument yes. that they had. Yes. That was a very serious threat, wouldn't you say? It was very serious. I remembered my mom telling Koro, if that is the case, you need to resign this job. You are my only son, and it's not worth your life. However, Koro told my mom, somebody has to do this job. I'm not going to be threatened from doing my job. You said that this occurred in May 1995. Do you recall if it was at the beginning of May, mid-May, or towards the end of May? I would believe it was around the end of May. And this threat from Edward Sinyata was serious enough for Koro to relay it to your mother, even though yes. he tried to uh, minimize it when you asked what was happening, correct? Yes, yes. How did you feel after that conversation? I was very worried for him. At the same time, I knew Koro, the type of person he was. Koro doesn't like to portray himself as a victim. When he believes in something, he will do that. So he believed that his work for the Gambian people is more important than a threat from the vice chairman. Did Koro um, explain what the argument he had with Edward Sinyate was about? No, I wasn't privileged to hear that side of the argument, no. So towards the end of May 1995, Koro relayed to your mother that Edward Sinyate threatened to kill him. Did anything else um, happen in relation to that particular issue? Did he receive yes. any other... I, please. Yes, he did. Um, that was also, I think, a few weeks after the conversation, I mean, a couple days or so after the conversation with mom, I received a note from... Abdullah Bojal called Jimmy at the time he was a prison guard. So I received a note from him uh, from Captain Kambi, who was at the time in mile two. At that time, who was Captain Kambi? What was your relationship? Captain, I was married to Captain Kambi at that time. And you said he was in mile two at that time? Yes, he was. Can you tell us what the note said? The note I read, after Koro read the note itself, so the note said for Koro to be very careful of Edward Singati, he was very ruthless and dangerous. So after I read that information, Koro took the paper from me and shredded it and threw it in the, in the kitchen whilst I was cooking. So he told me not to tell my mom at all because mom would be very worried for him. So I promised not to tell mom. However, I was very, very worried for him. So the man that Koro said had threatened him just at the end of May, a few weeks later or a few days later, I believe you said, a note yes. came from Captain Camby, also a soldier, telling you that that man was very ruthless, 
and dangerous. How did Koro really react after that? He didn't show any emotions. Like I said, as usual, he just brushed it under the rug and said, don't worry about it. Around that time, was Koro working on um, anything in particular in relation to his work? Yes, he was on his budget speech, which I remember took a lot of his time. He would spend hours and hours doing work for the budget speech. However, he related to me saying, after I'm done with this budget speech, you guys will be very, very proud. Did he explain what he meant by that? No, he did not. But I just knew he was thorough with his work. And I knew that whatever he was about to do, he was going to do it with his passion. So after um, Koro received the threat from Edward Sinyate, and then received a note from Captain Camby warning him, about Edward Sinyate being very ruthless and dangerous. Did you continue to see Koro in that period until you heard about um, what happened to him subsequently? Yes, he, he comes home every night because my mom told him, no matter how busy you are, you have to stop by and say hi to everybody daily. So no matter how late it was, Koro would always come home. And during those moments when Koro came home, did he say anything in relation to the budget speech that he was working on? Did he raise any he concerns? Um, not to me. I did not hear anything. But however, I would hear speculation that there was something cooking and Koro was going to reveal that there was some kind of discrepancy about some money. But he never told me that. Can you tell us a bit about um, what you heard in particular? What, uh, what do you mean by there was something cooking and there were some discrepancies? Did you have any further information about that? From what I was told, it's to do with some money that the military boys had received. And then Koro was telling them that what they would do was not the right thing to do. The money was for the Gambia to be invested and not for it to be shared amongst themselves. That's what I was told. When did you hear that information? That was before he, he died. sometime around the end of June, 1995. You said that Koro never discussed this particular issue with you. Do you know if anyone else in your family spoke to him about this? If I recall, I, I heard my dad talked about it briefly with my mom. He's worried about the rumors going in town about how strict Koro was with his work and how he wasn't going to allow anybody to embezzle any funds. So my dad, I had him talk to my mom one time and said, I'm very worried. I know Koro is very stubborn, but he will do his work as he is supposed to. So when he comes home, can you please talk to him? I had that conversation transpired between my parents. So you heard information that um, Koro w would uncover something in relation to the military junta's spending money that um, was supposed to be for the Gambian people. Can you tell us what happened on the 22nd of June, 1995? Do you recall that day? On the 22nd of June, I believe was on a Thursday. Koro came home around 8.30, around 
8 to 8.30 p.m. I could recall I was sitting outside because there was um, power outage. My parents were not home at the time. My little sisters were inside the house. My mom went to a christening ceremony. However, my dad was out of town. He went to visit his older brother in Georgetown. So Koro stood there with me whilst I was sitting outside. <clears throat> Excuse me. We just chit-chatted. He asked for mom. I said, mom was not here. And he asked whether dad was home yet. I said, no. So we just talked as a brother and sister for about half an hour. And then he left. I walked him to the door. And he said, tell mom I'll be back tomorrow. But that tomorrow never came. You told us that prior to that day, your mom had insisted that Koro come home every day after work. And yes. from what you've said, he had been doing just that every single day up until that day, the last day you saw him. Is that correct? Yes. Upon, up to the 22nd of June, 1995, he, he comes home every single day. And after you chatted and he left, um, you said it was just chit chat, nothing in particular. He said that he would return no. the next day, correct? Yes, yes, he said he would return the next day. But that was the last time I saw him. Can you tell us what happened the next day? The next day, Friday, June 23rd, I believe it was around 4 to 4.30 p.m., Kuro called my mom on his way to the airport to see the then President Jame off. I believe he was going to Addis Ababa. He called my mom and said he was heading to the airport, but he would be home straight from the airport. So I remembered he requested that we made him some nanburu and he wanted us to buy some mangoes because those were his favorite food. And that was the last conversation mom had with Koro. He never came home that day. We sat and waited and waited up until 1 a.m. Mom decided it was too late and it was raining. So she suggested maybe because of the rain, the flight was delayed. So we should go to bed until tomorrow morning. So on that day, the family was expecting Koro to come back that evening as he had done um, every day until then. And he called to tell you that he was going to the airport because the vice you said vice president, as in the vice chairman. Yeah, Jame was. The chairman, the chairman at the time was traveling. It's Yaya Jame. Indeed. And he said that he would come following his um, trip to the airport. Yes. When he didn't come and your mom suggested that there must have been a delay of the flight, did you consider that there could be another reason like he just changed his mind and changed plans? No, that's not Koro. When he tells you he's going to do something, Koro kept his word. So there was no reason for us to think he changed his mind. Even if he had to, he would have called to let us know. And in fact, by all accounts, he made a special request for the food that he wanted to eat. Um, yes. upon coming home, so there was no indication that he wouldn't have kept his word at that time. That's correct. So around 1 a.m. in the morning, your mom suggested that you all go to sleep and um, wait for Koro tomorrow. Can you tell us what happened the next day? The next day, Saturday, morning 
we had random phone calls. However, they kept they kept asking for Koro. They would never say anything. They would just say, "Is Koro around?" If you see, when we said no, the caller would hang up. So there were several calls that day in the morning. However, around one thirty that afternoon, we were in my mom's bedroom sitting down and eating lunch when the phone rang. So I picked up the phone. It was my mom's younger sister, my Mona. She asked if she could talk to my mom. So I handed the handset to my mom. But I could hear a little bit of my aunt's voice in the background. She asked my mom, where was Koro? And my mom said, he told us he was going to come yesterday, but he never did. So I don't know what's going on. So I had my aunt in the background said to my mom, I received a phone call saying Koro was in an accident. My mom, upon repeating those words, accident, I just told my mom, can I have the handset, please? She gave me the handset. I said, okay, let me hang up the phone. I will call the hospital because at the time I worked at the RVH. So I dialed the RVH straight to the accident and emergency unit. I asked them if there was any accident reported. I was told there was no reported. I told them to transfer me to the ICU, which they did. I asked if they had any accident victims. They told me there was no accident victim. So I hung up the phone. I decided to call Brikama telephone, I mean Brikama police station. Because according to the conversation that moms related to me, the accident happened somewhere around Brikama or Yundum, something like that. That was what was told to my mom. So when I called Brikama police station, I was told there was no accident reported. I hung up the phone. I called Yundum police station. And when I called Yundum police station, the gentleman that picked up the phone, I asked him, if there was any accident reported, he said yes. And I asked him, was it a black Mercedes Benz? He said yes. I asked again, was it GG1322? He said yes. And then my next question was, where is the victim? The gentleman just told me over the phone, not knowing who he was speaking to. He said, the victim was born, Chad, he's dead. At that moment, my heart almost stopped beating. I was looking straight into my mom's face I did not know how to tell my mom that his only son died. And it was at that moment, my two uncles, my dad's younger brothers, Uncle Moro, I believe it was, and Uncle Janko came running inside my mom's bedroom. And they just told mom, Koro died in a car accident. All of a sudden, my mom lost consciousness. That was her only son. Okay. Yeah. Yes.
How did you feel at that time? I, to be honest, I cannot even begin to tell you how I felt. I think at that moment I was in severe denial and my emotions were just numb. I was more worried at that time for my mom's safety because she kept losing consciousness, regaining it just to lose, lose consciousness again. At the back of my mind, I was myself, okay, they said Koro was dead. However, we cannot lose mom right now. At that time, where was your father? My father was in Georgetown. So it was just you, your mom, and some other relatives? My uncles and some other family members, yes. I want to ask you a few questions about something you've already um, told us. You mentioned that in the morning, you, your family received a number of phone calls from people asking, where is Koro? Correct? Yes. Yes. We heard from Mr. Lamin Kaba Bajo's testimony yesterday that after the flight left around in the evening, um, the night before, after an eight and a half hour flight, upon arrival, the president, the chairman at the time, Yaya Jame, informed them of Koro's death. During that morning, did you receive any information from the government about what had happened? We did not receive any phone call from the government that morning, nor had we received any kind of information from the government about that up to today. So in fact, while people were calling your house, asking where is Koro, chances are knew what had happened but you were busy making phone calls, calling hospitals and police stations, trying to find out what happened to your brother. Yes. You mentioned that the information you received, or the information your mother had received, was that the accident occurred around either Yundum or Brikama. And so it's when you called Brikama Police Station that you received information about the accident itself. It was Yundum Police Station. Brikama Yundum. Police told me they never had any accident. Yundum Police Station, yes. And the person you spoke to from Yundum Police Station told you that the body had been burned and it was charged. Yes, he said it, he was, he said, the victim is dead. He was charged. So he must have known something about it. But just to hear over the phone when he was saying or asking about a question, if there was any accident, just to be told the person you were looking for was born beyond recognition. That's devastating. Yes. Yeah. And you were able to tell that it was most likely your brother because of the vehicle. Is that correct? At that point, we did not conclude it was my brother. We just were praying. We did not know it could have been Koro, even his driver. But at that particular time, we were not sure that was Koro. 
And when your uncles came into the room and told your mom that Koro died in a car accident, at that point, can you tell us the reaction of everyone else in the house? You told us about your mother. Can you tell us what the atmosphere was like in the house? It was sheer pandemonium. People were screaming, people were yelling. I believe several members of the family passed out. And like I said, again, I was numb, but I was there for my mom and several other people when they passed out in my mom's bedroom, I was also trying to attend to them at the same time. In the course of that day, you told us that you did not receive any information from the government. Was your family able to find any additional information about what had happened to Koro that day? Um, yeah, as the evening progressed, rumors began to come out. Koro was indeed murdered by Edward Signate, Yanko Bature and several, but those were the two names that were around. Lieutenant Edward Singate, actually three names, let me correct myself. Lieutenant Edward Singate, Lieutenant Peter Singate, and Lieutenant Yanko Bature. Those were the names that were floating around. Can you tell us what, um, what kind of information you heard? Did you hear any details about um, the involvement of these, these three individuals? Um, not that um, very day. That very day, the information was that he was killed by these three individuals. However, as the days progressed, little bits of information began trickling in. And um, a little bit of the details started to come out. Like... Um, he was beaten with a baseball bat. That was one particular thing that was mentioned. And he's, he was killed, according to rumors, at Yanko Bature's house. And then he was driven, uh, and then they set the car on fire, according to rumors again, by Edward Singate, Peter Singate, and Yankuba. And it was during that time that people were saying Peter sustained a burn on his arm. So I never saw Peter, but everybody that saw him said he sure had some bandit around his arm. That was the information that was circling around the time. Well, let's take it day by day. So still focusing on yes. that Saturday, um, the mm -hmm. Saturday after you last saw Koro, when you heard about um, the accident and was told that he had died in the car accident. Yes. On that day, you heard this rumor that these three individuals were involved in his murder, Lieutenant Edward Signate, Lieutenant Peter Signate, and Lieutenant Yanko Bature. Can you tell us yes. if at any point um, you managed to see um, either the vehicle um, in which your brother was involved in the accident or your brother's um, body? Yes, I actually, I believed that Saturday I stayed with my mom the whole time. However, on Sunday afternoon, myself and some family members took a trip to the mortuary. And we went inside to see the remains of which they claim was Koro. 
I have no way to say that was my brother. When we walked inside the mortuary on a concrete slab, there laid a torso, a human torso, that's from the neck to the waist. That was charred beyond recognition. All you could recognize is the rib cages that this must be, at some point I even didn't think that was human because there was no head, there were no limbs at all. And in one corner they told us in the bag of rice, empty bag of rice, they told us it was the skull of Koro that was in there. So I went over, looked inside of it, it did not look like a human skull to me at all. So we left. Some family members went home, but I continued with other members to the accident site. Before so we move on to the accident, sorry, yes. just um, about your trip to the mortuary. Can you tell us yes. who went mortuary with you? Some of the people that went. Did your parents go with you? No. My parents were too devastated. And from the advice received from some of the family members that went that very Saturday evening, they thought it was best for my mom and dad not to see the remains that was in, in the mortuary at the time. So I went with my aunts and uncles to the mortuary, cousin of ours, Dr. Sanasise. When you arrived at the mortuary, how easy was it for you to have access to see your brother's corpse? The very first day, it was not that difficult, I believe, for the people that went Saturdays. But on Sunday, there was some restriction. When I got there, there were lots of people want to see Coral. Some family, or I cannot t tell who from who because there were so many people and I was not focused on faces at the time. However, when we wanted to get inside, we were told Koro's father gave orders not to allow anybody to go inside and see his remains. Was that true? So at the time, no, my father was not there. So I didn't, I don't know who gave the orders at the time, but it was not my dad. And in fact, you left with some of your aunts and uncles and you left home to go to the mortuary for that purpose? Yes. So did you, do you know why you were being prevented from accessing your brother's corpse? I, I don't know why. However, I managed to convince the guy at the door I told him that I was Koro's younger sister and I worked as us at the RBH. So can you please let me go inside and see my brother? He unlocked the door. However, he's, he's, he was still holding onto the handle. He didn't kind of open the door yet. He just unlocked it with the key. So he held onto the handle while some other members were trying to argue and prevent us from getting inside. Some were saying, no, your dad said don't go inside. I remember turning around and to uh, telling them, my dad is not here. So the argument went on for a little bit. And all of a sudden I got really upset. I just kicked the door and I walked inside the mortuary. 
So essentially you had to force your way in, in order to see your brother's body. Yes. You described to us what you saw, and then you told us thereafter, the family decided to go to the accident site. Is that correct? Some of us, yes. I believe it was oh, two or three of us. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes. Um, when we got there at the site itself, now it's a little bit fuzzy. I, I don't think the, the vehicle was there at the time. I believe it was already removed. However, there were some charred remains on the, on the ground of some mat and some wood and stuff. However, looking through it, I found a piece of bone that resembled a broken rib cage. So I picked it up. I took it home and I gave it to my mom. What was your mother's reaction? She cried a lot. However, she said, at least I have something of my boy. And you've already told us that Kuro was your mother's only son. Yes. So this occurred on Sunday evening, is that correct? Yes. Can you tell us what happened um, that night? Did anything day, in particular happen that night? Sunday, I believe Sunday afternoon, late evening, going to early night time, there were some people that came over the house as a delegation, they claimed, from the government. They requested if they can give Koro a state funeral. Do you recall My any parents, of those people? I cannot recall their names because I did not see them. I just heard from the elders that there were some members sent to the house. What was your family's reaction to their offer to um, host a state funeral? They were very, very upset, furious. They thought that was an insult and, an, and a mockery because Koro died, they didn't have the decency to go over to let us know that he died in a car accident, supposedly, but they requested a state funeral. So that did not sit well with my family at all. They declined that offer. So the first time that you received any formal um, offer or communication from people representing the government or claiming to represent the government was on Sunday evening. Is that correct? To my, recoll to my recollection, yes. Can you tell us what happened the next day? The next day was Monday, I believe, June 26th. That was the funeral day for Koro. It was a very tough day. Again, a lot of family members and myself, we headed to the mortuary again to, to bid farewell, to pray for him. So when we were going, mom gave us uh, um, the traditional woven material that he said, I mean, that my mom said, her dad gave it to her when she was getting married. So it was very important 
for her. She said, can you cover Usman's coffin with this? Before we got to that, we were allowed to go inside. I stood over the remains. I put my hand over it and prayed. Even though at the back of my mind, I was thinking maybe it's not him. However, I did not want to lose the opportunity to pray for him and say how much we love him and how much we going to miss him. Can you tell us what happened after that? Yeah, after that, he was put his remains in the coffin. I brought him outside. There were thousands of people. So, so many people. Even for the coffin to come out of the mortuary was a problem. The material mom gave them was put over his coffin first because they wanted to put the Gambia flag first and then mom's but mom the instruction that she gave when we left the house was the woven material she gave was supposed to be put over the coffin first before the gambian flag and that's what happened did the gambian flag have any special meaning in relation to koro well he was the son of gambia he believed in Gambia, he worked for the Gambia, so I believe that was significant for that to be put on Koro's coffin. So after you and the rest of your family took the coffin from the mortuary, where did you go next? Headed to Dipakur. The Dipakunda Mosque first. However, I was not amongst the people that went to the Dipakunda Mosque. I went back home to be with mom. And the rest of the family members, dad, his brothers, and well wishes, extended that family. Some of my sisters went to the Dipakunda Mosque to say the final janaza. Did you hear anything about what happened at the mosque that day after the janaza prayers? I was made to understand there was some scaffold, there was some argument between the civilians and the military people because the military personnel wanted to hold on to the coffin to transport it from the masjid to the graveyard. And the boys or the Gambian youth at the time, they were not buying it. They told them not to touch his coffin because they were the people that Koro. They were not allowed to touch his coffin that I was told. At this time, you were at home with your mom and other family members. Can you tell us about the atmosphere at your home on this day? It was a very, very sad day, extremely sad. The compound was full to capacity. The streets were filled with people. Mom was in the midst of people supporting her, give courage, talking to her, so she could just conform. She was totally devastated. Did any member of the AFPRC government come to your house to pay respects to your family? 
Yes, after the funeral services, Vice Chairman Lieutenant Edward Singate and Yankubo Ture, amongst other dignitaries, came to extend their condolences at the house. Can you tell us about that? What happened when they arrived? How did your family react to them? Um, when they arrived, I believe they met dad in the front, in the front yard, and they were told that mom was sitting outside in the backyard. So they proceeded to mom, mom was sitting on the mat with her sisters and her best friend and some of my dad's sisters too. Edward Singate approached my mom. He knelt down, he extended his hand to my mom to hold on to my mom's hand. And he said, accept my sympathy, mom. And then my mom said, you have some nerves to come here and extend your condolences after you killed my son. He did not respond. He just stayed quiet. But as he knelt down his other hand, he just set an envelope, which I believe there was some money in it. I didn't see it, but I, I didn't see what was inside, but he just set down an envelope on the mat next to my mom. So my mom just grabbed that envelope and threw it towards his entourage where one of the guys picked it up. However, after my mom did that, she looked straight into Edward's eyes and told Edward, just like Julius Caesar's spirit came back to the people that killed him, Koro's spirit will haunt each and every one of you. At the time, Edward quickly withdrew his hand from my mom and stood up for a second and then later he walked away, followed by his entourage. What happened to that envelope containing money? I would not know, because my mom threw it back at them, and one of the guys picked it up, so I don't know what happened to it. At that point, you had already, you've already told us that Towards the end of May, Koro had told your mom that Edward Sinyate had threatened to kill him. Yes. And thereafter, the accident occurred, and then your family heard rumors that the people who had murdered Koro were Lieutenant Yankuba Ture, Lieutenant Edward Sinyate, and Lieutenant Peter Sinyate. And that's what yes. led to your mother's statement on that particular occasion. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So after the conversation between your mom and Lieutenant Edward Sinyate, as the entourage were leaving, so the entourage of Edward Sinyate and um, Yanko Baturi, how did the other mourners react to them? They were screaming at them, telling them bye-bye, Mofala, meanings goodbye, killers. You told us that that was a very difficult day for your family. Yes. Can you tell us how your family coped um, in the days following um, those events? It, um, I don't think by ourselves we could. It was just by the grace of God. 
He was the one that was with us with his might, his power, and with the unrelentless support and love from family. We we took it one single day at a time. Following Koro's funeral, did any member of the government say anything to your family in relation to the steps that the government would take regarding um, Koro's death? Yes, I believe one week or so after the funeral, the president at the time, Yaya Jame, came to pay his condolences at the house, accompanied by Lieutenant Kababajo and some other members. I can't recall their names, but Kaba in particular, I recalled. Yaya Jame promised the family that he would make sure that no stone was left unturned in order to bring justice for Koro. But I remember during the time when he said that, one of my mom's younger sisters, Auntie Musu, said, how would you expect the killers to do justice? The commission has heard testimony from witnesses attesting to Chairman Jammer's statement that no stone would be left unturned. After your family heard that, how did you feel? Were you hopeful? Apart from what your aunt said, was the rest of the family hopeful? Um, hopeful a little bit. However, we were highly skeptical, um, knowing or suspecting that they were behind his mother we didn't think, even if they were going to do an investigation, it would have led to any results at all. In the days following um, Chairman Jane's, Jame's visit, did, was any member of your family questioned by the police, for example? Not that I know. I don't remember my family did, members being questioned. I cannot remember that. Did your family receive any information about any investigations being conducted into um, Koro's death? No, we did not receive any information according to my recollection. Um, however, after several weeks went by without hearing any information, I reached out to the chairman to make an appointment so my parents and I would go and see him so we can have an update. We were granted um, permission to go and see him. I believe it was in this, in the first or second week, first or second week of August, exactly a day after 40th day, I mean 40th day charity. Can you tell us about that visit to Chairman Yaya Jame in August of 1995? Um, yes. And that very day, it was my aunt Isotu, my mom's younger sister, myself. We took the trip to the state house. And upon arrival, we were told to sit and wait 
in the waiting room. So we sat there waiting for the chairman. So whilst we were sitting there, Lieutenant Edward Singatek walked towards us to say good morning. However, we did not respond to him. So he walked away. He came back, I think, I believe one or two more times, but he never said anything to us. So during that interval, whilst we were waiting, Captain Kababajo came out and escorted us into the chairman's office. And whilst we were in the chairman's office, we said, we said good morning. And my first question to him was, my parents were supposed to come with me. However, it was best not to come at this time. That's why I'm here with my aunt. So I asked him, I said, why did you guys kill Koro? He looked at me and said, we did not do that. We suspect the Jawara regime. And I looked at him and said, why would the Jawara regime do that? What connection has Koro to do with them? And why would they want Koro dead? He did not respond to that question. Why do you think he I told you? that they believed it was the Jawara regime? I have no idea why he said that. Maybe a cover. Sorry, say that again. I said I have no idea why he would say that. Probably a cover-up. Please continue telling us about your conversation. So I asked him, I said, why didn't you guys come over to the charity yesterday? He looked surprised and asked me, was it yesterday? And then I said, you said to us at the house that Koro was your friend and you couldn't recall your friend's 40th day charity. I said, what an awesome friend you are. And he looked at me and said, are you the nurse? I said, yes. Yeah. He told me, I heard you are very stubborn. He never answered the question. So my aunt asked him, why was Koro's body or Koro's vehicle at Jambur? Knowing that Koro went for to see you off. How did he end up in Jambur? He did not answer that question either. So at that time, he ordered Captain Kababajo to get him under his desk. And Captain Kababajo brought the bag and out of the bag, Yaya Jame grabbed bundle of couple bundles of money i don't know how much that was he said would you please accept this as my contribution to the charity and i told him we were not there for the money we were there to follow up and also for him to give us information not the money my aunt being diplomatic, she said, just accept it. It's for charity. However, at the back of my mind, I knew we would be in trouble once we get home. So before we left his office, I told President Jame that he needs to call my parents 
and give them an update. He promised he would. Before we were, before we left, we were interrupted, you know, by a gentleman for the second time. At which time, yeah, Jamie just yelled at the guy and said, "Let them wait." I don't know who was that, but that's what he said. And it was after that we left. So he promised he was going to call my parents. Did he call your parents? Yes, he did. Before you tell us about them. that, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Before you tell mm -hmm. us about that, during your conversation with Chairman Jame, did he at any point give you any information about the so-called investigation that he promised? Not at all. Did he provide you with any information about Koro's death at all during that conversation? Not at all. So in fact, the reason why you went to see him, which was to get an update on the investigation, you left without yes. any information whatsoever. Yes, that's correct. How would you describe his attitude towards Koro's death and the need to conduct an investigation? Uh, at first, like I said, when he came to the house, we were a little bit but skeptical. He pretended like he cared a lot about Koro, especially the day he came to the house. He even pretended he was crying. He took his handkerchief out, wiping his eyes. So he showed some kind of sincerity at the time. How would you describe his attitude during the meeting you just had, that you had with him in August 1995? How would you compare that to his visit to the family prior to that? At the time when he came home, he showed a little bit of empathy, I believed. However, at his meeting, I mean, when we met him at the office, it was just like a normal conversation you would have with an acquaintance. How did you feel after that meeting? I, to be frank, I, I don't even know how I felt because I couldn't conclude either way if he was going to do it or not. You told us that you asked him to call your parents and he actually called your parents. Can you tell us when he called them and um, what he said? He did call them, but there was barely any conversation. When he called, I remember it was a Sunday around 11 a.m. My dad went out with his brothers. My mom was in the shower. So I told them to call again. Like I said, give us 15, 20 minutes, call back. So they did. When they did, I told my mom that call was for her. That was President Jame on the phone. So my mom picked up the phone and said hello. So I could hear President Jame's voice on the other hand saying good morning, ma'am. And at that time, my mom was just like a ticking bomb emotionally. 
she just didn't, she just didn't want to hear their voice or see their faces. And at the time, my mom just yelled at President Jame and said, you guys don't have any shame. Don't you ever call me again. She hung up the phone. So I convinced my mom. I said, mom, I think you overreacted. Can you just give him a chance to explain what's going on? She said, I don't want to speak to him. However, a week or two went by. I called again to the state house and convinced Jame that he should call again. But my mom was just overly emotional at the time. So he promised. He called again. Sure enough, he had the same reaction. So my mom told him, don't ever contact this family again. And he never did. You told us that during your visit to Chairman Jammer's office, he offered, he gave your family money and your aunt, yes. being the diplomat, agreed to take the money. Can you tell us what happened to that money? When we got home and explained what transpired at the meeting, my parents were furious. They told us they don't need the money. They were not going to sell their integrity, nor were they going to get any money from the government on Koro's behalf at any point in time. So they told us that we need to return that money immediately. So some elders advised my parents not to do that. They told them that it would seem to be a little bit uncooperative. So my mom insisted that money would not spend even an hour in that household to be spent in the name of Koro. So the family agreed the money was to be distributed amongst the local masjid for charity, which they did. So as we all know, 24 years later, we've heard testimony from witnesses who've told us that no investigations were conducted. In any event, no progress was made. Can you tell us about the impact that your brother's death has had on your family over the last 24 years? Tremendous impact, tremendous. The family lost Koro. However, on that very day Koro died, it seemed we also lost our mom. She was there physically with us. However, emotionally, my mom was gone. We started all over again, every day, one day at a time. Mom could just not handle the loss at all. So the family elders met again. They decided it would be best if mom would leave that environment until further noticed. So that's how the families started moving out of the Gambia to the United States, one member at a time. So we relocated to Michigan to stay with my mom's younger brother, Uncle Modu. It was tough, however, with Uncle Modu's support and some 
very kind people that God brought our way. The love we had for each other and the support. By the grace of God, we are here today. Can you tell us a bit about the impact it had on you and your sisters growing up without your older brother? Devastated. I, we were all fond of Koro. He was our role model. He was very strict though. <laughs> he would not settle for anything less. Highly disciplined. He would motivate us to do the best and to be progressive members of the society. He would always say, go and leave your mark in this world. Don't sit by. Do something. So, born that early, was very difficult, very difficult. You told us about the impact it had on your mother, again, um, Koro being her only son. What about your dad? Yes. Can you tell us what impact it had on him? Um, dad was a strong man. Koro, we always make fun of him. You're like, you are a carbon copy of dad. You guys are highly disciplined. Don't show any victimization of yourselves or any sense that you are by any means soft, even though they are very soft people inside. They are very loving. Dad would not show his emotions. He would be strong for the family. However, there are several times that I saw my dad in the living room very early in the morning, staring at Koro's picture in the living room. He would cry. We never spoke about it. We just looked into each other's eyes and I walked away. He never to see, I mean, for us to see that he was crying, even though we know it took a tremendous toll on him too. He had to be strong for all of us, especially my mom who was not only Koro's mom, but Koro's confidant, Koro's cheerleader. Mom and Koro, they had a very special bond. Koro would represent my mom to meetings, symposiums, if mom was busy. Koro's friends would come over the house and mom would engage in discussion with them, politically, religiously, socially, because mom believed in social justice and compassion. My mom was very compassionate, very compassionate. So that was very devastating for mom to lose not only her son, but her best friend, too. Your brother died at the age of 33, or rather he was murdered at the age of 33, about three yes. months after joining the AFPRC government. Yes. You provided the TRRC with a statement, um, a witness statement about what happened and I would just like to read 
a short paragraph about um, some of what you said. Yes. I'm quoting from your statement. You said, over the years, my parents waited for justice for Koro's death, but it never came. They yearned for the day when Koro's murder was solved. On April 13th, 2014, our dad passed away without getting justice for Koro. Barely two months after dad's death, on 4th June 2014, our mom also passed away without justice for Koro. My mom's last discussion on the day of her passing was about Koro. Do you recall stating that? Yes. I did. My parents waited and waited and waited. There was no justice. My mom would always talk about Koro every time. However, at the back of her mind, she would always say, maybe someday Kuro will come home. Maybe someday. And we will also say, okay, mom, maybe someday. She cling on to hope that maybe someday, somewhere, Kuro was going to come, to come home. But he never did until my parents passed away. Thank you very much for, ask, for answering all my questions. I have come to the end of my question, Mr. Chairman. I yield the floor to the commissioners for any additional questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma Council. And thank you very much, um, uh, Bajen, for your testimony. I will not personally be able to to ask any questions. I knew the family very well. Your mom and I were very close. We were classmates in Yindum. The family in Bansang, she and Modu were older than me. Your namesake was my mom in Bansang. I can't go further. If any commissioners have any questions, please go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Carr, please, go on. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Carr, I have a few questions I want to ask about your brother's work with young people. Uh, you mentioned that he was very passionate about um, youth empowerment. What were some of the initiatives that he worked with um, young people on? Um, locally, he would work with I mean, the neighborhood kids. He would encourage them to further their education. And if he knows that someone wasn't interested in education that much, he would always encourage that person to pursue, to do something in skills and trade. He didn't believe in people wasting their lives away saying, I cannot be educated. He said everybody was born with potential. So he encouraged people to be the best they know how to, whether in education or skills. So when he had the opportunity to meet with some fine Gambian people, at the time, young Gambians who aspired to transform the Gambia, that's when he joined heads with them and started the Quantum Associates, which is now flourishing very well in the Gambia. And I believe there are hundreds and hundreds of Gambians that went through Quantum Associates. Thank you. The second question is, um, you spoke about how his 
um, that affected your family. Um, how would you say his death also affected the young people that he worked with? They were stated because in the community we lived in, um, see, you have to realize there was not that much interaction between youths and their parents. It was between youths and teachers, educators. Other than that, when you come home, it's either you go to Dara or probably go study back. So for somebody like Koro to be there, to listen to them, to motivate them, I believe also affected those kids to have a mentor and somebody that believed in what they can do. Thank you. My final question is you've discussed with your brother a lot and you are very aware of his work with young people and his passion with young people. What do you think would be his message for Gambian youth if he were alive this day? If he were alive, he would still tell them to pursue their life's job, their career, stand up for justice and do what's right. And I believe that there is a little bit of Koro in all his sisters that are left behind. We all, by the grace of God, finish our education and in respective fields and believed in helping people and got the motivation and the discipline that Koro had that we saw in him that we're still doing all of us right now. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Imam C, you have the floor, please. Did Koro have a wife or any children? No, he did not. We thank you. The narration you gave between you and your brother and the way you related. And how you went about his affairs. You spoke about it and you did not lose your control. You didn't cry. We thank you and appreciate you for that. The fact that uh, you were in control of yourself and you had faith in God. And your mom and the assistance you gave her. We thank you for that as well. Thank you, Imam C. To lighten the emotion for me today, when I was told, imagine that you were coming, I never saw you before. As I said, I knew the family very well in Bansa, your namesake. So I've been looking very closely in the monitor to see who you really look like. Your grandmother, uh, the namesake, she was a beautiful lady, very kind. Thank you. Very compassionate and uh, very dignified. You would wash me up. Uh, you use lotion to take care of me when she's taking care of the other kids when my mother would then come and get me. But the part that really was not even uh, uh, easy for me, and that's some uh, note to these hearings, was uh, the moment we were, as I said, Cliff family, Fatu and Modu were uh, older than me, and they were taking me around as a small brother. So when Fatu and I met at Yundum College, same class, we would be sitting next to each other in class, lots of things we would do with each other. Now, at this particular time, when she was pregnant, I believe, I fear, I said, it could have been you, and uh, I would touch her on the stomach and say, Fatu, so we would just keep on joking. And uh, one time we went for a nature walk and uh, this centipede I picked up and we went in some corner. I said to her, and then she did that. I put the centipede there. She jumped up and then said, I would touch that. Now, years later, if you were the baby in her stomach, 
for me to have the first communication with you via video, I say this, life is just unbelievable. So when I think about that, it takes some uh, things, the emotions are uh, down for me a little bit as um, uh, you narrate uh, uh, her remarks and her reaction and other things. But she was fantastic. Sorry, that's a footnote uh, to what he's saying. But you're a very strong lady, and uh, uh, you did Thank your you. testimony in a very dignified, Fatusanian way. Thank you again so much, Emma, for uh, coming. I don't know if you have any last words, Emma, to say. Please, if you do, go ahead. Yes, I would like to thank the Sise and the Sanyang family. I would also like to send special thanks to my Uncle Modus family, um, Ella Charles in America here, Roberta Charles, I mean, Roberta Lloyd, and lastly, and not, but not the least, Uncle Tyrone Johnson. These were people that God sent our way. They helped us, support us emotionally, financially, socially, every step of the way graduations, wedding, christening ceremonies, they were there for us. But my special thanks goes to the Gambian people in the Gambia and the diaspora who were relentless and never let Koro's case rest one bit. They went above and beyond to fight for Koro and fight for family when we were down emotionally and couldn't even stand up to talk on our own behalf. So I thank the Gambian community in the Gambia and the diaspora. And to you, the TRRC Commission, thank you for the work you're doing. We pray that whilst God has chosen you guys to sit there and see that justice is done, we hope and pray that God will make it easy for you to do justice. Let us not mistaking forgiveness and justice. Forgiveness can go hand in hand with justice. My special thanks also to all my sisters, my younger sisters, especially Aisutu, Nafi, Sukai, Benta, for being so supportive of me all these years, especially today. When I woke up, I'll say I, didn't, I did not even sleep last night. I was very nervous. And they called me this morning. We all prayed together. They video conference with me. My husband kept calling, Mr. Ahmed Ujaite, kept calling from work. And I thank him sincerely for his support over the years. He is very supportive of me and my siblings. I cannot but say thank you to everybody, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Bajan. I'm sure Fatu is my smiling from my heaven, and uh, would all be very. She'll be very proud of you, your testimony, your presentation. Yeah compassion, kindness, and uh, dignity, uh, all quintessential fatu. Again, thank you so much for your testimony. Council, there is no arrangement. Uh, are we ready for tomorrow? We come back here at uh, 10 o'clock. Is that okay? Can you confirm? Yes, Mr. Chair, I can confirm. Uh, we should be ready for tomorrow. Interesting witness. Splendid. Thank you very much. Meetings adjourn. We meet again tomorrow morning at 10. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.